miss this or you have to leave a little bit earlier, uh, you can always catch up on it later or kind of brush up on it. And then separately, feel free to contact Nick. He loves your he loves your questions. So that's what a president does, right? Uh, uh, it's, I do take questions. I do take phone calls. I do as well. So feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, so Nick, I didn't prep you on any of this. So my question to you is, you've been involved with NABOR almost 10 years, right? Just about? Yep, 20, 20, pretty much 2013 is when I started. So yeah. my question, not having been in your shoes and knowing kind of what it's like to be a real estate agent and using NABOR to your best advantage, what is the benefit of being as involved as you are in NABOR as a real estate agent? How, why did you get involved? Where has it kind of taken you? Well, I, I think for me, the, the networking side is, I think, very valuable there. Um, there's a lot of different events we do, membership meetings, membership events, membership appreciation, all the education classes. I got involved from in 2013 on the YPN committee. Uh, at the time, I got licensed in 05, and a lot of those of you that have been here for a long time know uh, there was not a lot of young realtors back in those days. So uh, in 2010, I started meeting a few of them. In 2013, I got on the YPN committee, and for me, it was nice to to be around and meet other young realtors, um, realtors that I could bounce ideas off of and uh, experiences off of and stuff like that to, you know, how did you break into this market as a young person in this town uh, dealing with a lot of retirees and second, um, you know, second home buyers and stuff like that. How did you break into it? So it was kind of fun to almost have like roundtable discussions. Obviously, we did it at the the bar a lot of time over cocktails, which was nice too. But uh, it was fun to just kind of get that yeah. uh, understanding and, and feedback from others. Well, and I think go the YPN situations. program is really active. Um, there, there was an event just a couple of weeks ago. It was coffee. It was like eight or eight thirty in the morning. Coffee morning. up at Mercado. Um, and that's a really cool event. I'm excited to hopefully be more involved in it. Um, but it's yeah, they do those quarterly. Now. Pretty informal, right? I mean, it's come sure. come and show up. You're gonna have speakers, and and I'm sure, I'm sure it could be a good good way. So I love that. So that's how you kind of got broken into it. It kind of normalizes things for you, right? Like it just puts it in perspective. Much more sense of reality of of you know, like I said, dealing with other people in this in this industry that is, you know, the average age. I think Florida Realtors came out that the average or NAR one or the other. Came out with it. The average realtor is like 58 years old or 55 okay. years old. So, you know, for the white pianers, which is technically 40 and under, and you know, it's uh, it's it's a rarity, so to speak. So, it's kind of nice to to you know have the camaraderie with some of them and, and kind of get to know them and again bounce ideas off each other and you know past experiences and what worked, what doesn't work, and you know how did you get through certain certain you know certain situations. So, so that was your gateway drug. Yep. get in there and then where do you go from there how does that so from there I, I just kept getting involved my cues uh was one that was kind of pushing me to you know try out the leadership academy which i did that in 2014 uh from there uh, i got to know a lot more about the board about the mls side and i had uh, the opportunity to, to attend it, you know every single committee meeting at one point throughout the six month summer program um which was interesting i found out a lot of committees that i didn't even know about and got to an understanding of what they did and it was kind of this passion. I, you know, I got into MLS committee. I got into budget and finance committee. I uh, tried for a couple of years to get onto legal resources, which I finally did, which was wonderful. And uh, but it's it, was, a, it is a very cool it, committee. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting my first committee. Year on it. Yeah, it's, got it's very collaborative. Um, you show up. You have you have people from every different brokerage. You have attorneys from different law firms, yep. and you get in the room and you're on the same team for the first time. Yeah. potentially ever uh <laughs> i did competitors working together competitors working together everyone's in, in, bring something different to the table it was, very much it's really kind of neat um and they do a, a very important function for the yep. for the committee for yeah and then just kind of took it for, you know from there into those couple of committees and got on to apply for the board for the 2016 year and got accepted and uh, been there ever since and was treasurer for two years on the board and then president like last year and now president of the board this year so Following in some good footsteps. Well, I think I think the thing I notice is that you treat it like a full time gig, right? Because it is like a, a full time gig. gig. It, it can be. It, it's well, not. I don't mean just neighbor. I mean your career. Oh, this, for this, sure. Yeah, the real estate. And that's career. where you know the, the 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 education that you get in the real estate industry overall, uh, the travel opportunities we do to Florida Realtors in Orlando twice a year. Uh, you know, we we hear a lot of 
the the issues that are happening around the state, we hear about them in advance and kind of start to prep for them and stuff. You know, and uh, you know, Mike Hughes is one of them at the state level. You know, the wire fraud that started back in 2017, 2018, 2019. Yeah, yeah. We knew about it four or five months before it really even came to Naples um, by other other brokers yeah. over in the Miami area. Yeah. So it's stuff like that. You know, you you network around the state. I mean, I've paid a lot of referral fees to other agents around the state, and I've also collected. Um, so it's kind of oh, nice to have cool. that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really nice to have that additional benefit because you know I've got buyers that come in here and they look here and they also want to see Sarasota and they're also looking at like Jupiter area, yeah. you know, some places. So it's it's nice to have other realtors that you know around the around the state to be able to refer business to and from. Yeah, and, and I think that is kind of how you bring your game to the next level yeah. is that you're very connected. That if you haven't seen it before, you know someone who may have. Mm -hmm. And I work the same way, so. Um, you know, I, I used to practice at a large firm in Georgia, in Atlanta, and it was really great to have that shared experience. Yeah. And then you join the local bar uh, boards and the, the Florida bar, the Georgia bar, and you can start to really expand. And it's you're just laying breadcrumbs, right? Correct. Some things are going to pan out and other things it's a waste of your time. But mm -hmm. collectively, it's been a huge promotion for you. Yeah. I mean, just with the board um, through committees and stuff like that, you kind of it's a name recognition. Your name. Sure. Are, people okay. know you. People learn, you know. Who you are, respect you, and get your reputation. You know these last two years of you know twenty through twenty twenty two with COVID, you know, and the crazy real estate market we we dealt with. There was a lot of realtors, you know, listings that I talked with. We had multiple offers, and they knew me. They knew how I did business, and they knew pretty much it's you know if I'm bringing a solid buyer, it's a done deal. Um, so sometimes you know it was my buyer's offer that got through. You know, beating out 10, 11 others, and it wasn't the price. Yeah. So you're it, speaking to two connection. things that I've talked about a lot. Number one is you're building trust. Correct. So I'll tell people all the time, and to you guys that are on this class, one of the big reasons I do this, other than educating, is I want to build trust. I, I want you guys to know me that if I'm on the other side of a deal, even if you're not using me, that you know that I'm going to treat you fairly and that yep. you can always call me. Yep. Um, and that, that really does give us an advantage, especially you know, and you know, if you're a listing agent who has to speak to their seller and report to their seller, and you've got 10, 11 offers, and you've done two or three deals with this one agent, and and a lot of the other ones are, you know, one or two here, but you yeah, know, they they never went well or brand new agents and stuff, and you know, it's you know the seller's full decision, but at the same time you look and say, I've worked with this agent before. You know, maybe we can get the buyer up a little bit higher, but at least that I know that agent's going to be yeah, it keeps you trustworthy. It's, it's going to be a yeah. comfortable sale. It's going to be a smooth transaction. Yeah, because at the end of the day, it matters to you as well. Yeah, it's the seller's decision, but this is your career. You're yeah. not trying to waste your time. Yep. You have you have a path that you need to meander. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I do, the reason why I think this is very helpful, is um, you probably don't have as much time to dilly dally. No. <laughs> yeah. So. Staying busy is a huge benefit in this business because you're not going to overthink it. Yep. You're not going to underthink it. You've got the education, you've got the connections, you got the you know the resources, but you're gonna you're gonna have to say, all right, we've got to make the decision because I have an event at eight o'clock that I have to go to. Yep. So let's do it. And I always I always kind of came up with that with a different perspective of like act like you're busy. You actually are busy, which is helpful. It actually is helpful. So when I get called, if I look at my the history of my text messages with you, it's like answer this one question. Here's what I think, and then I just say, yeah, you're you're dead on, or you know, here's another angle on it, and yeah. then you just you run with it, and that is so empowering, not only just to work with with you, but also for the other clients, for for your clients, for the other side. Mm -hmm. we're going to say what we we're going to do what we say, and then we're going to move with it, and and. I think it's key in this business. It's so a relationship business. So relationship business, perfect trans transition to the topic at hand, MLS. So here's the trend. This is the real transition. I asked you about this yesterday, this issue, and it came up because I was told. I don't know how how to best explain this. So there is a, there's rules for when you post a listing as pending or pending with contingencies or closed. There are rules, and we're going to go over them. Yep. But when someone, I I got word that someone was violating those rules potentially. Uh, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I have to put those conditions on there. So someone was potentially violating those rules, and I said, ask the agent. I said, put this information in front of them, and give them this information that they really do need to post this uh, act or pending status. 
And the response was, my broker looked at it and says, it's fine. And so I went to you and I said, I said, Nick, here's something I'm seeing. I have some concerns about it. And he says, well, who's the broker? And I said, I told him who the broker was. He said, no way in hell. I said, I bet my house, I bet Christian's house, the fact that that broker did not say that. He bet my house that yeah. that broker did not no say chance. that. No chance. And so context is key in so many ways. If I would, I firmly believe if you didn't know who this other broker was, if you weren't as involved as you are, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have that context. And you just take no. it at face value. It's like, oh, well, maybe he's right. Yeah. Alternatively, it's like, no, no, that's not possible. And it gave us direction. It gave us purpose. And it motivated us to do this class, which I'm excited about. So here's, here's the issue. And when we go through scenarios, I was always taught, and the thing that I love to do is issue spot. That is number one rule in this book, in this game, is we got to know the issues. We don't have to know the answer. Yeah. That's what president is for. That's what <laughs> I'm for. Uh, we don't. You don't have to know the answer, but you do have to spot the issues, because if you don't spot the issue, we're dead in the water. Yeah. The issue can balloon. It can become much worse than it should have been. Any business. If you don't, if you don't know there's a problem. So here's the issue. Um, when you accept an offer. So well, actually, let's back up. You put the house on the market. We're on MLS, Multiple Listing Service. That's what it stands for, right? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> so you put it, you put it active in, on MLS. Other other agents see it. You get an offer. You pick one. You go under contract. It may have contingencies. It may be no contingencies. What is the rule that MLS says that the listing agent has to do upon accepting an offer? Upon an offer being accepted, upon an offer being accepted, they have three business days to mark that property pending, either pending with contingency or pending if there are no contingencies with it. Where does that rule come from? That is in the the so each board of MLS, in this case Nabor, which is the one I belong to, of course, um, we have our own rules and regulations. A lot of these rules are probably, I would say 80 to 90 percent of these rules are dictated through NAR, rules that you have to have. The remaining 10, 20 percent or so are local rules that you can modify and change. Uh, this is one that uh, our co-op, being the Fort Myers Royal Palm Board, the Benita Board, and the Naples Board, all agree where our rules are. You have three business days to mark that property pending. And one of the biggest reasons behind that, and this is uh, um, I've, actually this might even be an NAR rule. I didn't even look into it, but the reason behind it is it's a misrepresentation to the general public. That, you, that they see an active listing, think they can go purchase the property, but it's under contract. And you know there has to be some form of grace period because there's a lot of realtors that have um, a lot of brokerage firms that they, that they require the broker to be the one to, to change the status. Some of them have um, assistance and, and stuff like that to sure. change the status. So they do give them a, a, a cushion, if you will, of three yeah. business days, but by the end of the third business day, it does need to be marked pending Otherwise, you are in violation of the MLS rules. So let's let's uh, role play it. You accept an offer on Monday because you had a busy weekend, multiple offers. Mm -hmm. You finally pick one. You sign it on Monday. And you then, per MLS guidelines, mm -hmm. have three business days. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. By the Correct. end of Thursday. By the end of day Thursday, it needs to be Needs to be marked pending. Uh, and there are different options for how it's pending. And those... Those options, those statuses, they do change over the years. But right they now, they're pretty standard. Yeah, right now we have um, you have financing, inspection, sale of a home, of, you know, sale of a buyer's home. Um, could be a kickout clause, which is um, um, otherwise known, otherwise as a kick. first right refusal. You um, you've got a third party approval, which could be a, an attorney review. Um, things like it could be a uh, like a court appointed type of situation might have to have some other third party that has to review and approve it. Um, or you could have some other odd situation, which I think RMLS says see remarks, in which case you can put remarks as to what that um, contingency is. But those are the main contingencies that we have in ours. So let's say we accept a deal and it's got a financing contingency. Mm -hmm. um, the problem that we're seeing is that listing agents are a little weary of marking it pending. They're either especially where even if it's marking, you know, it pending with contingency, financing contingency, whatever it is, because generally what you would think is there might be a mark or stain on that listing. Correct. What's yeah. wrong with it? Um, so let's say continuing this role play, you accept that offer. It's on a Monday. They've got 
seven day due diligence on a standard NABOR contract. Mm -hmm. So they've got all week to do their inspections. Yeah. Separately is the financing thing, but that's going to be a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, buyer decides to um, you know do their inspection on Wednesday. And you have a listing that says, oh, well, buyer's going to do their inspection Wednesday. I'll hold off on marking this pending until whenever, right? Let's yeah. wait till next week. But if they're following the rules, they know they have to get it marked by Thursday. Correct. As pending with contingencies. Uh, but if they don't know the rules, they're going to mark it next week <laughs> after inspection. Period. And, and I can't tell you how many times agents, you know, they'll say, well, I don't have the deposit yet. Well, that's doesn't a great matter. point. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The, they haven't done their the inspection positive. yet. Yeah. Keep in mind that the, the, the contract itself and the terms of the contract have zero to do with the MLS rules. Zero. The MLS rules supersede the contract. So you can write into your contract. Um, property will stay active for seven days until the inspection period is over. Doesn't matter. The MLS rules still supersede the sales contracts. And sellers, sellers do not dictate the MLS rules. So you, when you join any board, doesn't matter which one it is, neighbor, for instance, you know, when you join the MLS, you are agreeing to abide by those rules. And again, a seller does not dictate the MLS rules. So, so we saw a contract recently that said in the other terms and conditions, um, seller shall be permitted to continue marketing the house as active uh, in hopes of securing a backup offer. That's generally what it's. I've said. seen that a few times. Yeah. Yeah. So and, it, and so it's like, all right, well, it's in the contract. Obviously, they can they can extend it. They can they can wait the three days, or maybe they just don't even realize the three days. That's not something that you can override. Correct. MLS isn't going to give you a waiver. Neighbor is not going to give you a waiver. There's no way you. Can, the only thing is that all of a sudden you're in violation. The seller won't care. Nope. And that's the other problem is the sellers. I think you and I talked about it, sellers are dictating too many deals. And which ones, not just like which ones to accept, but like how it's marketed and correct pricing and commissions. And they're just it, it, it seems it definitely seems where sellers seem to be more in control of the realtor versus the realtor in control of the seller or the buyer. And it's, you know, and I always say for myself, I, you know, the number one rule is I don't fight with my clients. Correct. That's a good rule to have. I think so. too. But I do like educating them mm -hmm. and I'm not a pushover. So if you are if you want to do something. I'm going to say, okay, that's always going to be my first answer. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Happy to. But have you considered all the scenarios? You know, option one, option two, option three. My suggestion is always going to be option three because of these reasons. Do you still want to do yours? Do you still want to do it your way? Yeah. And then if if I need to say, look, you're, you, want, you want to do that, that's fine. In fact, I, I had a deal yesterday where the seller was adamant of taking it out of his trust prior to closing and put it into his name personally. And I think there are a lot of attorneys, a lot of, a lot of people that would just say, yes, sir, may I have another? Yeah. <laughs> um, what I did instead is I called him, I said, what's going on? You know, it's kind of like if you, if you go to the mechanic and you say, uh, rotate the tires, mm -hmm. I don't know what a tire is. And I'm telling the mechanic what to do. Yeah. Instead, what I should do is like, hey, I'm worried about the shuttering of the tire or the, the wear isn't right or I, whatever. I should tell them, what would you recommend? Mm -hmm. And then you take the information and then you do it. Okay. Um, I would suggest the same thing. And that's what as realtors, as attorneys, we need to help our clients make the best decision, yeah. their decision, but help them make it. Correct. All right. So. The really important question. We've gotten to the big part, which is three-day rule. Mm -hmm. um, I will just warn you, and we'll go over this. There are fines if you violate this rule. Or any MLS rule. Yeah. Or any MLS rules. There's a whole appendix of this fine, this rule, this like, violation. First offense, second offense, third like offense. 95 pages long. It's a lot. There's a whole <laughs> appendix just for the violations for individual rules. Correct. How do we overcome this? You're you're a great listing agent. I mean, potentially, right? You're you're okay. <laughs> I, I have my moments. You have your moments. <laughs> you have a very good track record of getting deals under contract and getting them closed. And mm -hmm. in this class, I've always talked about it's a three-headed monster. Yep. It's get under contract, protect your client, and get it closed. You have to do all three. You can't yep. miss one. So in that sense, you're presented with this issue of. I'm just not in love with this buyer. 
We've had we've been messed around before by other buyers. This house has been harder to sell. I want to wait as long as possible to list it pending. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you need to list it pending. How do you overcome it? How do you sell it? Do you overthink it? I mean, that we talked about that earlier. You try not to overthink it, but how do you overcome a, a house that's come off the market and then has to go back on trying to accept new offers? As a listing agent? As a listing agent. How do you overcome I mean, And of course, it's it's a common question that you'll get from the buyer's agents of, you know, I saw it was pending. You know, why did it fall what apart? Happens? You know, as, as a buyer's agent side, I always look to see how long was it pending. If it's in that, you know, three to 15 day period, most likely it was for inspection. inspection. Uh, it could have been, you know, condos where you have the three-day right of rescission. It could have been a deposit issue. Could have been. Um, usually, you'll, obviously, that'll be on the, you know, three, four-day quicker. And, of course, as everyone knows, you know, some of that 25 to 35-day range is most likely going to be financing. So I just kind of look at those and, and take them, you know, with a grain of salt. I thought I'd, you know, tell my buyers what I'm looking at. You know, it went pending twice. Looks like it fell apart twice, probably around the financing side of things. Um, but still, I always call it the listing agent just to find out and ask them and, you know, represent the buyer side. If I'm a single agent, I'm going to try to find out what leverage I can. Transaction agent, your job is to get the deal closed. On the listing side, I'm straight up honest with the, with the buyer's agents. I tell them what happened with it. You know, the buyer did their inspections and they weren't comfortable with it. Or yeah. buyer found something and they, you know, in our opinion, as the seller side, they were asking for egregious repairs to be made and, you know, outside of the, of the context of the contract and, it was going to become a bigger argument. We agreed to terminate the. You know, Have you ever it, shared it, previous inspection reports? Um, I if I do, I ask the seller first. Good. It's always up to the seller. Um, in in their minds, if they feel that the inspection report is fair, you know, even if it has defective items in there, you know, that are damaged or whatever, it's um, if they feel it's a fair inspection. Yes. If they feel that, wait a second, that's that's not even broken. Why why is that on there? Or that's that's a cosmetic item. Why is that on there? You'll get some sellers that say, well, I'd rather not that be shared. I'd rather let the, the new buyer do their own. Um, the times that I have shared it, I've also said to the buyer's agent, look, here's the last one that was done. You know, it's up to your buyer whether or not they want to, to use this, get their own inspection. You know, I would encourage a new inspection no matter what, personally, if I'm on the buyer's side of it, just because I would want, you know, my buyers to have a full um, unbiased look at that property. You know, when you're spending... Three hundred thousand dollars to three million dollars or more. You want to know what it is that you're buying. Yeah. So okay. I mean, it, so I I have had them shared before. Yes. Perfect. So, all right. It's kind of a no nonsense approach. It really is. We don't have time to overthink it. We have to. You know, we follow the guidelines. We can stretch it as much as three days. Mm -hmm. What three days, happened? Days, yeah. What could you imagine? This is. I can't imagine this has happened to you, but maybe it has. You don't mark it pending. We go under contract Monday. This is that role play. Yep. Go to contract Monday. We have till Thursday. We wait. Mm -hmm. They do their inspection on Tuesday or they whatever happens. And then you keep showing the property because that's your intent. Now, I, and I'm not saying you do this, but I have seen a lot of listing agents. They're like, look, we're just maximized. We need to get as many bodies in here as possible. Mm -hmm. Maybe you even accepted the offer on a Friday and you're, you've got appointments signed up already. Yeah. So now you're on the buyer side. Mm -hmm. Selling agent Nick shows up to the to the open house that's been been hosted, and you spend your whole afternoon with your buyer going through it, thinking about making an offer, and you finally decide, all right, we're gonna make an offer. You know, the buyer's excited, let's do it. And the listing agent says, Oh, we accepted an offer a couple of days ago. You pretty happy about that? No. Why what is that? I, what, I, what, my, why, why is that matter? What my, my question would be is is obviously they can still hold an open house as long as that property is marked pending an MLS, they can still try to obtain a backup contract. Yes. And so therefore, but they, again, you cannot mislead the public. And you are or, the public, and I'm fellow whether, member whether, whether as well. I'm, whether I'm a realtor operating as, you know, purchasing myself or, you know, representing buyers, I'm still a member of the general public. So you cannot misrepresent that. You have to tell everybody we have the properties under contract. We are still showing it for, you know, to potential uh, other buyers for, as backup contract opportunities, 
but they do have to disclose to you that the property is under contract. Well, and it's, it's just fair. Correct. Right? You spent your whole Saturday, Sunday going through the property mm -hmm. with your buyers. You spent hours and hours on this. And then you went home, you put together the offer, and you get it for signatures. The buyer, your buyers, but you know, probably wanted to go to dinner, decided not to. Yeah. And all of a sudden, oh, yeah, no, we, we already accept an offer. You have to... Uh, you know, include the black backup. And your question is, well, when did you go under contract? Oh, two, three days ago. Yeah. It's incredibly irritating. So the guideline, that's our why. That's why these guidelines are here is to protect Correct. you guys from spinning your wheels. Mm -hmm. And so in the scenario where you're actually under contract, you don't see the harm of it. But if you're an outside buyer, there's a ton of harm. And so you're harming your other right. members, your other buyers, you're kind of disintegrating the integrity of the transactions of, of like, hey, this is on MLS and, and we just wasted all our time. All of a sudden, the buyers in our market are frustrated. And they well, may pull out. Yeah, to take another step is, you know, th there could have been another property that they didn't get to go see because they wanted this one instead. Or they, you know, it's a... Yeah, I was just thinking about dinner. Also, but, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but also now they're, you know, you as the buyer's agent, you know, your buyer's upset with you because why didn't you find out it was pending? Or now, that, now they start yeah. to look at you as the problem, not the listing side. Which yeah. Is, so, and that, it's in its own uncomfortable situation. It to is be uncomfortable. In the buyer situation or buyer's agent is, you know, how do you explain some of these things? Now from With, a listing- Without throwing the other realtor under the bus, even you gotta be honest, but at the same time, you, you can't you can't attack or, or um, slander another realtor in general. It's against yeah. the code of ethics. So I would say I've always the only time I've ever gotten myself in trouble was when I didn't tell the whole truth, yeah. right? I, I never intentionally tried to lie or anything, but when I tried to kind of like hide something that wasn't in our favor, mm -hmm. it always backfired. Yeah. And and again, the more time you have to deliberate, and the more of a pushover you are on some of these with some of these sellers, the yeah. more likely you're going to make that mistake. And so I just stay away from that entirely. Jerry, I see you on there. Are you are you available to talk? Oh, he's available to talk. So Jerry is uh, a broker at Downing Fry in the Bonita office. And Jerry, I'm really curious. You've been listening this this whole time. You're kind of a listing guru, in my opinion. Do you have any input on this? How you would kind of sell this, and how you kind of manage these issues? Well, the biggest thing that hurts the credibility of the agents when they're not aware of something that should have been pended or should have been done and they show up with the customer just what nick was saying i mean all of a sudden how come you didn't know about this <laughs> so that's the most embarrassing part of this going on um everybody has a reason for not pending it you know i i have to delay it for some they're all the wrong reasons though based upon what the mls rules are they're so, all the wrong. There is no exemption. From well, and, no. And, and even 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 if you want to wait to that Thursday, the market pending, and you have three, four, five showings on Monday, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you still have to disclose the fact that the property is under contract. You can't just let them show the property without notifying them, because otherwise you're misleading the general public, and you cannot do that. That's a violation. You shouldn't Go do it anyways. It, it says a it it pulls at your credibility. And we talked initially. Trust is all you have in this business. It's the yeah. only thing you literally have. Yeah, there is no hard. confessional that an agent can go to and ask for forgiveness. Not oh, that's it. the only reason I came to Benita. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. So Valerie has a question next. So you can continue to show a property and or have open houses when it's marked pending an MLS. You can, as long as you are, you know, anything that you're doing with the general public, whether it be social media advertising, stuff like that, you can mark and advertise the property. Yeah. It has to be marked pending an MLS, pending or pending with contingencies, whatever it is. But you have to disclose that it is under contract. And this is only purely for backup contract purposes or backup to a backup contract, for instance. So this one, I, I don't really know the exact answer on this one, but the question is, how about a listing agent that puts a listing in MLS and won't allow showings until Monday, so maybe after an open house on Sunday, one business day after putting in MLS, but it's legit per MLS rules, question mark. So that that's, uh, they're probably referring to the clear cooperation rules, which states the moment you market or advertise a property to the general public in some way, shape or form, whether it be you know, online, whether it be social media stuff, whether it be print advertising, whether it be flyers, whether it be open house signs, anything like that, you have to have that property in MLS within one business day. Awesome. Here's the rule. 
Public marketing includes, but is not limited to, flyers, displays, and windows, yard signs, digital marketing, and public-facing websites, Facebook, mm -hmm. next, uh, next door, I think, um, brokerage website displays, digital communications marketing, like email blasts, multi-brokerage listing sharing networks, like MLS, mm -hmm. and application available to the general public. So if you're going to market the property, it has to go into MLS. Within one business day. The, 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 the moment you market to the general public or any of those ways, correct. So the carve-outs, and this is where, you know, disclosure, you know, double check with an attorney, right? Mm -hmm. But there are potentially some workarounds. And this part's the fun part. I'm really excited about this. Uh, how do you get around some of this stuff? Well, you, what, what, you're, what you are allowed to do is you are allowed to um, notify the agents within your brokerage firm. So inter-brokerage. Correct, inter-brokerage. So you, we see it all the time, you know, yep. for agents, and, I'm, and I did it myself. So they're coming soon. This property will be hitting the market. You know, I've got one that's coming on this coming Friday. I've notified with an in-house down in Pride about it for, you know, I think I started last Friday about it. Um, so you can market within your company about it. And your agents at that point, you know, the moment an agent messes up and starts notifying the public. So, so they, do. They, well, <laughs> yeah. So, you, and you can also, if you have an agent, for instance, who does, uh, you know, primary business in that business in that community, you can talk to that one agent specifically about it, about the property coming on, but you cannot provide any marketing, advertising, flyers, nothing. Don't that cross that line in the sand. Correct. You can notify another realtor about it. You just cannot provide any marketing materials about it. So this, this, uh, we sent out an article, Ross Title sent out an article, and and I think my dad's on here if he wants to unmute himself. But we talked about clear cooperation, and this was something that I don't know if a lot of people loved this uh, workaround as well. But what if the seller were to promote the th the property on Facebook? You know, it's it's different. You're not doing it. Uh, you're not doing the public marketing. Your seller is. Dad, you're on there. I, I heard a I heard a clear of your throat. I'm here. All right. What did what where did that come from? Had you heard that before? I got this from uh, the gym on Marco Island, actually. A lady who's on the board at, at the Marco uh, board talked about how they were working around this. Uh, they were, uh, you know, listing it on Friday, doing their open houses and so forth, uh, and not putting it in MLS until the following Monday. <clears throat> and, and, you know, and that's, you know, unfortunately, it is possible, allowed right? for the rules. And I think many of us have seen it, you know, ever since this clear cooperation came out two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was, there are workarounds for sure. And the, the, the primary purpose behind clear cooperation to begin with was so that every member of the general public had an opportunity to purchase any particular property that they were looking for. And, you know, whether you agree with the rule or not, I'm not sure if it really perfectly fixes the problem because again you can still deal with in-house you know i mean I, this condo i have on mm -hmm. friday very well could be under contract you want to give them the address is it listed in it MLS? It, it's in all the emails i've sent out um <laughs> but it, it's you know it could very well be under contract before it even goes out on mls anyways and christian uh nick the earlier question from somebody was what happens if it's listed and then it says no showings over the weekend or for three or four days. And that stops the showings. And it could be a devious reason why they're doing it. That doesn't isn't covered under clear cooperation. No, that's that's under our MLS rules. Um, and, and Jerry, I cannot answer the exact. I, I, I don't have the exact answer, but I do know that that is part of our MLS rules where uh, and maybe Mike might know it, but I see him on there also. You. The, the property has to be in withdrawn status unless it can be shown and therefore it can be an active status. But there was a time frame that we had in there and I, and I honestly don't remember the time frame. but it has to be, if, if the property mm -hmm. is not able to be shown, it needs to be kept in withdrawn status if it's on the market. And Please one last thing, questions. earlier when you talked about turning over the home inspection to a buyer, Let's remember that home inspection is not the sellers to turn over. It was provided by the buyer at their cost. So I don't know if it needs the approval of the buyer to turn it over or not. I, I've been, I've been, my understanding, once the contract has been terminated, because that 
theoretically has been the inspection report has been given to the seller side. It is now the sellers, you know, to do what they want with if necessary. Sellers aren't bound That's, by the same rules. Yeah. So they you know, we kind of have to give them that latitude. Yeah. This one, I love this point, and I'm really curious your input. Some of the top listing agents in Naples simply ignore the three-day rule, which is going to allow us to get into kind of what the violations actually are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we'll wait until inspection or diligence period is over. As buyer buyer agents, we aren't reporting them as we want to maintain a good relationship. Wow, mm -hmm. that, that's tricky. Question, that's, how many tricky. fines or complaints are actually made or levied? And we talked about this very briefly as to like, what the what the board's intentions are in these rules and how it's kind of the, so the board at least I mean I, and I'm only speaking for a neighbor but our intention is to have good accurate data if a property is available we want it to be available if it's yeah. not available we want it to not be available do you believe in MLS generally as a great marketing tool it's fantastic I agree fantastic I think that's key it's, number one yeah it's a great marketing tool but you know I mean, but the problem is if you know, we need to, we, we need to, um, we need to hold each other accountable as realtors. And if there is a violation, you need to talk to that agent and say, look, you're in violation. Here's the rule. You need to mark it pending. And, you know, and sometimes you hate to tattle or rattle, you know, tattle somebody yeah. out, but at the same time, it's, it's unethical for what they're doing. And sometimes you need to Turn them in and let them learn that lesson. If they're not going to abide by the MLS rules, you know you have your the first first violations a warning, second one's a fine, and they have to take an MLS class. You know, I would do. It keeps going. Mm -hmm. I'd blame my cues. <laughs> <laughs> I would say my broker made me do it. My broker made me do it, or and then I would have Mike do it for you. And that way, you know, clean hands. Dad, is there any uh, thought? Blame on the lawyer. Blame the lawyer. Blame so the my lawyer. mom and dad said it all the time growing up. Just blame me. Yeah. If you're uncomfortable, that's my job. Team, that's my job, right? That's yeah. my job. Blame Christian Ross. He's the attorney. He made me do it. We protect um, the realtor, you know. Yeah, we protect the realtor. It, yeah. We do need this business to work well and not being on MLS. Sure. Um, the other side of this is we are seeing fines. Um, there, there is there is a process for it. So. I pulled up the appendix, and this is available for anyone to download. If the status is not changed within three business days after a new status took effect, the agent will be subject to discipline as outlined in Article 7. Article 7 then references you to the appendix. So it says the first violation, and this goes to the other reason why some listing agents maybe are willing to break the rules. Um, no first violation, no fine. You get a warning. You get a chance to cure Mm -hmm. Now the bottom there. No, see if there's a if it kept going or not. Not really. Uh, and then the second violation is a two hundred fifty dollar fine, which could be just because you didn't cure the default. So you could immediately get a second uh, violation, two hundred fifty dollar fine. Correct. And then mandatory MLS course. They're going to make you train for the violation you just caused. The third violation is a committee hearing, and that part I think is really interesting. You've been on those. Mm -hmm. I went to an ethics committee hearing okay. yesterday. Um, it's scary. Oh, it is. It'll it, freak you out. Yes, it does. What is what does it look like? Who's involved? Well, the the on the fine side, you go into a committee hearing. Is basically it goes before the MLS committee in this case, and they review all the violations and the fines. And obviously, some of these, like you know, first and second, they're structured as to what they are. Once you reach to a third, all of a sudden now it's it's, it's the old adage of a uh, you know repeat offender and. The, the, they have the authority to basically fine up to a maximum um in each, in each section is different as to what the maximums are but um like there's some that are fifteen thousand dollar fines and you know at the board fining is the last thing we want to do we just want we want you know the agents to cooperate we want them to be fair and we want accurate data we do not want to find unfortunately in some situations finding is the only way to get compliance and and it's you know, again, it's it's unfortunate, but that sometimes is the at least that is ability that is there because yeah. it at some point has some real teeth. You know, so, so theoretically, an agent who you know, let's say on one property, they they end up with the the first violation and they cure it. Second property, you know, a month later, they same violation. Now it's their second second violation of that same type of fine. You have a two hundred fifty dollar fine in an MLS class, and two months later, they do it again on a third property. That's coming before the MLS committee, and and there are 
um, the ability to either a hefty fine. Um, we've had, uh, you can have MLS privileges revoked. And I think every realtor would agree, if you lose your MLS privileges, it's very Dead difficult to sell property. Yeah, very difficult. So, I mean, there are, you know, obviously that is an egregious um, violation yeah. Yeah. You know, to, to have happen, but it things like that can progress to that nature. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm glad it does. I'll give one caveat to that or one addition to that. I was in this ethics committee hearing yesterday and the person that made the complaint actually didn't show up. So it, it's intimidating. It is. And so this person decided not to show up. The committee decided to move forward without them. That, and that happened. And so they took over the complainant's role and said, you know what, this is enough of an issue. Yep. We want an answer on it. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually kind of neat because it's like these things, the board has the ability to kick you out. They don't want you there. They kick you out eventually. So things matter. And your you mentioned it. Repeat offender matters. How many how many times have you been in front of the board? How many times have you gotten a fine? You know, are you late on your payments? I'm sure it yeah. comes into it. You know, all and, that. And keep in mind, these things kind of go on your record. So even if you tr switch to other boards, you know, the board has the right to request, you know, the so to speak, the file of of a realtor. That can be in the file. Yeah, so. uh, attorneys are the same way. So yeah. you know, one of the things that keeps me in the straight and narrow is that the, I, if I lose my ability to practice law, uh, I would be in real trouble. So um, the last thing I want is someone to complain to Florida Bar. Uh, luckily, there's a due there's a um, there's a process for it, and that you know my rights aren't going to be violated just Im immediately. Which so that's the Correct. benefit. Someone could complain about you. It doesn't end there. That's just no. the start. Mm -hmm. And you'll have the ability to um, have due process. Uh, this part I thought was this question or a statement I see, especially on high end properties that agents put the property under withdrawn after two days, they put it back as active. They do the same thing several times. You mentioned earlier, timing matters two days. It's like, well, what happened? Hard to in, know, in, but... in, in especially the higher end properties, um, you know, it, it could very well that they've got, you know, they have special guests in town. And they don't want the showings to happen. Um, there you go. Little things like that. It could be that they, you know, something being, you know, big repair job is happening. Um, they could you know, be for snicket. Could be could a be. total pain in the butt. Could be. <laughs> we've all we've all had those. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's it, it can be it, anything like that. Any reason why the seller doesn't want the property shown or some of that. That's what the withdrawal is for. All right. So let's finish this one up. Bring it full circle. We all know we have to follow the rules. Yes. What it. This this was the thing, and and so I was talking to a buyer's agent, and he said, "All right, if we, or it may, but it might have been a listing agent on this case." He said, "All right, if the rule is three days, what are my workarounds within those rules? How can I get this where I maybe don't have to take it off the market?" And this is it's going to be on me. I'm just going to curious what your opinion will be on each scenario. <laughs> All right, so option number one, <clears throat> normal deal. So the listing agent suggested, what if we do a three-day due diligence period, as is contract? We'll know by day three whether the buyer's moving forward or not. Um, that's a good, it's a really good solution. But you mentioned the downside of that is what the buyer says, what the heck? Yeah, now, it, you're what can you get done in three days on an caught, inspection? You're kind of throwing some red flags to a buyer as to why, why do they want this done so fast. It does. It's red flag. And you mentioned mold and radon reports. You can't get those done in 48 hour report. 48 hours. You're not doing inspection day zero. You're doing inspection day one or two. Yeah. 48 hours later, you're picking it up. You, oh, by the way, you still have to negotiate some sort of credit. Well, or... and, and plus, I mean, if, you know, if there are some damages to the property that need to be repaired, sometimes it's, you may not know what the cost is going to be. You may not know the extents of it. You know, so it's, it's, it's it, three days is very difficult. And Very difficult. I'm on the buyer side, but like shows up some red flags. It red flags like what's wrong? And Why here's the trick so on a standard contract, neighbor. It doesn't stop at three days. So you might try to be cute and get that three day inspection period, but the buyer still has five more days to negotiate the buyer election. Correct. They just have to have their inspections done inside that three day period. Right. So you'd have to use an as is or you're over to the far bar contracts, standard or as is would, would work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, three days. I'm gonna kind of take that off the table unless Unless you have it all lined up and you don't do mold and radon, maybe maybe you could pull it off. But that's option number one. My suggestion was you really just need to shorten the time frame as much as possible so that yeah. future Be buyers um, aren't freaked out by how many days it was off the market. Mm -hmm. So if I say if I give you seven days, you think you get all the inspections done generally? 
It's tight, but Bob, it's Rob, tight. It yeah. gives you a week, right? You're going to be through a weekend. Um, I've taken it off the market for a whole weekend where otherwise I would have liked to have backup offers, but I'm off the market. I'm pending. Um, I'm giving you your chance. And I believe in you as a buyer um, because I don't have any other reason to think. Yeah, I don't know other <laughs> offer, right? But I, I, I'm going to do my due diligence to make sure, do I have proof of funds up front? Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that was interesting to me coming down to Naples was the contract doesn't require proof of funds. You have to require it before yes. you go under contract. So that's a trick. Get your proof of funds up front. Get your earnest money immediately. Adding in a previous class I talked about, have the deposit made before you grant access to the property is a big one because some buyers are trying to play that game. But again, you can't, you got to be careful with that dictation. Well, I'm getting right in trouble with President Nabel. Well, you're, 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 well, you know your contracts too. Jeez so please. Obviously, you're, you're, one doesn't have- Hey, I'm to being have, reasonable, Nick. One doesn't have anything to do with the other. You're, you have three days to put in you're your closet. <laughs> if you want to do inspections on day two, you can get a schedule. Well, have seller has to, seller has Good to work. luck to you people <laughs> working with this guy. Um, There's a lot of dining brands that, that would disagree with you there. I can't wait. So that, and that's the great part about these contracts is that there are a million ways you can do this. Yeah. Um, but this is just to give you that perspective. So another solution, um, no contract. How many of your clients no do not live in Naples full-time? Uh, oh, God. Full-time, I would say probably 75% of them. And but you're I, a I local. Like you... You were raised here, mm -hmm. right? When did you, when, were you born here? No, moved here in 03. 03. He's as local as he gets, right? I'm, <laughs> I, I got you beat. But so most of our buyers and sellers are transplants from other areas. And I would say you can maybe use this to your advantage. If you have a contract in New York, the typical process, and it's not uh, always done this way, but most of the time. And Jerry, I, I need, are you North Jersey, Jerry? We're South Jersey. Yeah, I'm Central Jersey. We so I don't know how to answer that. How did you miss it? <laughs> how did I miss it? All right. So, Jerry, I might need your, your feedback on this. New York, Jersey, North Jersey at least, you're going to make an offer as a buyer. Let, almost think of it like a letter of intent. It's not a formal contract. It's more like purchase price, closing date, any of the general terms. And then you're gonna the seller's going to agree verbally usually. And then you let the buyer do inspections. You have no contract. Mm -hmm. You have a general idea of what the terms are, what you guys agreed to. Do your inspections, and then you come to the table and you sign a contract. So yeah, I know this is giving you pause. I'll get you. Well, I, an I'll, I mean, I'll tell you this: like on the the listing side, I wouldn't allow it. Good. And the reason being is because in the sales contract, it dictates if something happens during the inspection, the inspector or the buyer is responsible to get those repairs. Mate, so if an inspector breaks, God, are you a lawyer or what? Goodness oh gracious! I've, I've learned from some good lawyers. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there is liability on a, for sell, a seller. sellers have some protection. The seller has and a liability. Listing yeah. brokers does. So, Christian, we never ever did. Go we ahead. never ever did a deal like that. I don't care how close north I was. We never <laughs> did a deal like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me give you a hypothetical. This actually, it's not hypothetical because it actually happened. My mother in law <laughs> was selling her house in New York, Long Island. You ever heard of Long Island, Jerry? Uh, is that a drink? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's still early. All right, so selling her house in Long Island. She uh, has multiple showings, multiple offers. She accepts one, but it's mostly verbal. It was in an email hey, we'll pay $400,000, we'll close in August, we'll make a deal. So they say, great, let's do it. They let the buyer do their inspections. You know, the inspector does have liability insurance, Nick. Come on now. Yeah, but a little harder. I love it. More so, <laughs> so you've got the buyer does their inspections, and then they intend to come back to the seller, my mother-in-law, and, and to formalize the deal, sign the contract at that point. At that point, the buyer knows what's wrong with the house. Mm -hmm. They know that it needs a new air conditioning, and so I'm going to need a $4,000 credit to cover the cost. Yeah. Interestingly. In the meantime, seller gets another offer, $25,000 more than the previous buyer. In writing? Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. That, so there you go. Can the seller accept it? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So that so listing agent, it gives you pause. As a buyer's agent, it gives you pause. But it is done that way in other parts of the country. And if you are, if you're really worried, really worried, I think overly worried, or paranoid even, that taking the house off the market will stain it forever. 
then that is an option. You could just not sign a contract. I'll draft you a liability waiver, you know, for a fee, of course. <laughs> I'll, I'll protect the seller, right? And, and that way you can keep marketing the property. You're not in violation of MLS rules. I, we obviously don't love this idea. It's it's not a fantastic idea I, in this yeah, market. I would, I would have drastic pause for sure. Drastic pause, <laughs> drastic pause. All right, so that leads to the last point. Dad, are you still on there? I'm still here. All right, so you and I, when I first came back into Naples, we kind of enjoyed the competition of standard contract or as is. You mean we argue like crazy? Yes, exactly. <laughs> we totally disagree. We still probably aren't on the same page on it. Does a standard contract protect the listing agent and the seller more on uh, keeping a deal together? It it does. I mean, it has language in there. I think statistically uh, it does. Yeah. yeah and, and, and this is just purely anecdotal. And I've had other agents tell me this. Uh, a lot of buyers don't realize or a lot of sellers don't realize that the buyer has the right to terminate the contract if the seller refused to make a, a repair or give a credit for something that's defined as defective. It's Provided not it's at reasonable. the top of the... Provided it's reasonable reasonable the yeah, but, it, but it, yeah, it's, it's got to be, you know, fit under the definition of, uh, of uh, defective. As, and so those hang together better. As Don, Don, as you told me one time, a, a, you know, a 20-year-old AC system, buyer can't request a brand new AC system. Oh yeah, the last line under that section says that the if I, cost if I could to repair that, or okay. replace shall not exceed the value of that right, right. item right. if it were in working to condition. To be a tad more accurate, what I tell my buyers is, you know, look at line 317, you're not entitled to a brand new air conditioning system, but it doesn't hurt to ask for it. You know, if you don't ask, you don't get. But, but, but would you say a buyer can't terminate because the seller says no? No, he can't terminate, but okay. you, you always was, ask for the sun, the moon, the stars, but you prepare your buyer that you're not entitled to this so they don't go crazy when they don't get it. Yeah. So if you ask for a $100 credit on, on a 20-year-old AC system and the seller yeah. says no, well, then you can I, would get say, I would say buyer has a right to terminate, yes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, and then that all goes to strategy. We like to advise people to, you know, yeah. don't be cheap about it if the if the buyer is asking for a brand new this came up like a week yeah. ago buyer asked for a brand new ac unit we know line 317 we don't want to give them 20 bucks that's probably what it's worth it, it's it, it was 26 years old here yeah. in naples it's worth about 20 bucks yeah. if that in fact Parts. seller might have to pay the buyer yeah <laughs> to take over this yeah. uh, but giving them 20 dollars is a slap in the face and it makes it worse so i always oh. say 500 bucks, right? You, right you also to, have to, Christian, if I could look at, is the second deposit down because that'll dictate how much teeth the contract really has. And yeah. then also the size of the deal. If you're dealing with a $5 million deal and you're refusing to do some minor repair, that's almost a slap in the face to the buyer who's a wealthy person. Mm -hmm. And those people do things on principle you know, and they don't care about the money so much. It, it, it's case by case basis as to what, yes. what's reasonable. Love it. Uh, following up, someone says, uh, I'm suspicious that the agent has his own buyer and does not want to have another agent in between, puts it on withdrawn and sees what happens. You don't need to discuss this, but that's what might be happening. Yeah, it happens quite a bit. Theoretically, I mean, it's it could be. I mean, I, I don't get it. Why yeah. would you put it? What's I the, mean, maybe you're, you're, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting yourself. You're manipulating the seller. Hurting yourself. I mean, you, I mean, if somebody files you know, a complaint against you, you better have your paperwork that shows... The seller and the broker signing that withdrawn form. Seller and broker signing reactivation form. So you better have your paperwork if you're trying to do those things. Well, Mike will just post date everything. Right? <laughs> He'll do that. <laughs> Jerry will too. Yeah, Jerry will post date. So there you go. There you go. Well, I, to, I hope I everybody to really enjoyed this topic. That. What was that, Mike? I need to unmute myself on that one. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. So thank you for joining us. Mike. Nick Bobzine. Yeah. yeah. Mike, you got something else? No, nope. no, nope. uh, just I don't post date. Yeah. No post, no <laughs> posting. Um, so smart. Keeps out of trouble. Nick Bobzine, President of Nabor, Downing Fry. If you need me, Christian Ross at Ross Title. Uh, Don Ross at Ross Title, Jerry Murphy at Downing Fry, uh, Mike Hughes at Downing Fry. I would say a quick, quick plug at uh, 2 o'clock today, Nabor, we have the 2022 year-end market conference report. And our, oh, very, on that. our very own Mike Hughes will be uh, one of our panelists as well. So uh, it's a great report. It, it'll give you guys good analysis of what happened in 2022. Did you talk and we have close to 400 people attending. 
uh, by yeah. Zoom and in person. So it's it's going to have a wealth of information. Yeah. So uh, if, you, if you got it goes from two to three thirty, it may not quite go that long, but ballpark. So if you got the time, it'd be wise to attend either Zoom or in person. So. All right, so uh, I did a poll. You guys probably aren't going to see it. How many days do you have to update your listing? Three business days. Three. Uh, second one, who, who does it hurt if you do not update the status of your listing? Pretty much everybody. You have to select all of them. And then who is the NABOR president, Nick Bobzine or Christian Ross? You better get that one right. <laughs> all right, guys. Nick, can I 